Okay, this unit uh, lesson is on classifying organisms. So it's unit one, lesson two, which is in two parts. This is the first part. Uh, as I go through this lesson, I want you to look for these uh, answers. What methods are used to classify living things into groups? Remember the definition of classification. And why does every species have a scientific name? You may not be familiar with species, but we'll be going over that. <clears throat> to classify. Classify means to arrange things into groups. And when you do that, the process of grouping those objects, those things into group, based upon their similarities, is called classification. <clears throat> now, we classify all the time, or hopefully you do. And one way we classify is like, let's say, in the garage, all the tools. And so you have certain places for certain kinds of tools, all the screwdrivers in one place, hopefully, if you're organized, all the screws in one place, all the nuts, all the nails, you know, and the wrenches and everything. So that, so when it comes to time to have uh, a project, it's easy for you to get to the tools and to deal with them. Same with your kitchen. The cabinets and the drawers are classified according to the utensils and the plates. So can you imagine the job of setting the table if there was no classification in your kitchen at all? Plates could be here, there, you know, not all together, just some up here, some over there, some in another cabinet, some in a drawer, and silverware as well. And it would take you a long time to set the table if there was no order, if there was no arranging those objects into groups. So you have a silverware drawer, you have a, a cabinet where you keep the glasses, you have a cabinet where you keep the plates and pots and pans and so forth. So we do classify all the time, or hopefully we do, and it's actually part of organizing. But why we need it in this particular uh, situation for science, we will look at in just a minute. This whole science and it is a science, a branch of science. It's called taxonomy. And these taxonomists, their job is to classify organisms into group, living organisms, what we've been talking about, a complete living thing. Now remember, the word taxis comes from a Greek word, or the word taxonomy comes from a Greek word, taxis, which means arrangement or order. And so there's people who are taxonomists, and we'll learn later on, they actually meet in committees, and there's changes that have to be made, and we'll see why, and there's additions that have to be made. So this is a branch, branch of science, which is the scientists are classifying organisms, living organisms, into their groups. There are two kinds of objects that we have out in our world. We have inanimate objects, which are not living, meaning not that they're dead, meaning they never were alive. They never had the characteristics of life that we looked at in lesson one. <clears throat> Those which do possess life, the characteristics of life, they are called animate objects. And you can see a rock up there. You studied a lot of inanimate objects last year when you studied about the earth and you studied about volcanoes and you studied about stars. Animate is what we're looking at because we're looking at living things. They possess life, whether they're alive now or whether they're dead. They once were alive, so they're still animate. Now, in classifying organisms, there's been many different ideas on how to organize and to classify living things. Uh, the first that we have on record is Aristotle. So he's the first known taxonomist that actually classified living organisms. And he had two main groups <clears throat> called plants and animals. Then later on in the 1700s, Carolus Linnaeus came up with a classification system that also had two groups, which he called kingdoms, and it was kingdom animalia and kingdom plantae. And both of these classification groups were based upon similarities that you could see appearance. So what evidence is used to classify living things into groups? Now what we use, and we have more than six, I mean more than two kingdoms, we actually have six, <clears throat> they look at what type of cell it is, which is eukaryotic and prokaryotic. They look at if it's complex or if it's simple. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> it looks as if they're autotroph or if they have to get their own food. Autotrophs mean they make their own food. Heterotrophs have to get their food from somebody that made food. In other words, animals getting it from the plants. So they look at that, and they also look at the number of cells in their body, which have unicellular organisms, which we looked at when we were looking at the classification, and we have multicellular organisms. And so those things are used to help put them in the groups that they are classified in. The current classification method for organisms that we use, which began with Linnaeus, we still use his system today, because <clears throat> it was good and because it's flexible, and you can add on to it. It's called systematics, and systematics uses all known evidence to classify organisms, including the cell type, how they get their food and energy, <clears throat> the structure, the function of the features that they have, their common ancestry is actually what the evolutionists use, and their molecular analysis. So those are all the different ways that the modern classification system has used to classify all living known organisms. Now let's look at this hierarchy a little bit and let's look at the first classification system that was done by Aristotle. Now remember, <clears throat> when you look at this system you're going to think, well I could have done that in kindergarten. Remember when Aristotle lived. He lived before Christ and Christ's time. So not a lot of science knowledge, not a lot of knowledge back then about science and about how many organisms. They didn't know anything about microscopic organisms. They didn't know anything about organisms in the deep oceans and way up high in the sky, none of that kind of stuff. So what Aristotle did was he looked at the organisms in his time that he was around and he looked at them and he separated them into plants and animals. Then he did subcategories. So under the plants he looked at if they had no woody parts he called those herbs and he classified them as herbs. If he saw several short stem-like woody structures he called that a shrub and if they had one main woody stem, which would be the trunk, they call, he called it a tree. So all plants were then subdivided into one of the, these three categories. Then under the animals, he did three subcategories as well, based upon the way that they move. If they swam, he put them as fish. If they flew, he put them as birds. And if they walked, he put them as land animals. And that was Aristotle's classification system. It was based upon physical characteristics, based upon appearance, based upon the woody parts, based upon how <clears throat> they moved. And even though it was a simplified system, because of the time era that he lived in, it was used in the universities back then for 2,000 years. So that's how long Aristotle's classification system was used. <clears throat> then in the 1700s came along Carolus Linnaeus. Now he, and I really like this guy in that when he was in school and he was looking at this systematic arrangement for botany, he had to study botany because he was actually becoming a doctor, and they studied botany for plants. <clears throat> so he saw there were problems. Now a lot of times what do we do? If we see there's a problem, we say, okay, I'll just learn it for the test, there's a problem with it, I don't care, and go on. He didn't stop there. He saw a problem, so he set out to correct it. And that took some care to a man figure out how hard that was. Because back in his day, he had a lot more organisms that were known. And so he started to sketch and come up with his own classification system. In that, he wrote two books. And one was on, remember, he had two main groups, plants and animals as well, just like Aristotle did. And so he wrote two books. One was on classifying the plants, and one was on classifying the animals. The one that was for classifying plants was called Species Plantarum. And the one that was for his classification for animals, he called Systema Naturae. And Species Plantarum, it was published in 1753, so it was the mid-1700s, 
and that was his basis for his plant classification and you can see there a picture of the original book there the inside um, cover or not cover but the inside page and here's his book System of Naturi. Now there were several revisions this is the most well-known one and it was published in 1758 now that's wrong because it says 1753 plantarum was in 1753 i need to change this because it took him five years then to work on the animal classification system and come out with his animal book and so that says plant so ignore what this is saying right here because it is published in 1758 so make sure you write that down and it was for his animal classification. So plantae has the word plant in it. So that should be easy to associate with plants. Naturi, think nature and the animals that are out in nature. Now, Carolus Linnaeus, because of his work, because we actually still use his system today, we trace this science of classifying organisms into groups, taxonomy, all the way back to this man in the mid 1700s and so he is known as the father of modern biological classification or the father of taxonomy now you might want to know about this why does it say Linney up there instead of Linnaeus well he became a doctor he worked for the royalty there <clears throat> and so because of all his work and his outstanding job that he did he was actually knighted and when he was knighted, they changed the name. So he became Carl von Linney. So Carl von Linney and Carolus Linnaeus are the same man. Another thing that we're going to look at is he actually came up with the modern way that we name organisms. Scientific naming, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But you need to realize his system was also based upon physical characteristics. It was based upon similarities, similarities that you could see, observe. So it was like um, Aristotle's. And that's called an artificial classification system when it is based upon physical characteristics. And uh, you might want to know, do they have any other kind of system based not on physical appearance? They're actually working on it. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me. Because of the expense that it involves and because of the time, it's taken along. Uh, so they're not completed with it. And you might guess what would it be based on if it's not based upon physical characteristics. What have they discovered in these last 10, 20 years, this last couple decades that we've used a lot in forensics to identify people? DNA. So that's called a natural classification system when it's based upon the DNA that the organism has. Okay, now you need to know, and you better be able to list these in order, the seven basic levels of classification that Linnaeus came up with. The order is from largest to smallest, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And there's some examples of some organisms with their classification names there. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Now it doesn't really stop there. A, a species would be like um, horses. So a species would be one particular type of horse. We have lots of different. Uh, a species, let's say, is a dog. Um, a dog is Canis familiaris. So their species is familiaris. And there's lots of different kinds of dogs that are in familiaris, because all dogs belong in it. So we have subcategorized even under species now and divided them into subspecies or we call it usually varieties, uh, like a Dachshund and, you know, a Bulldog and those kinds of things. So we can add. They even have added on, like, subphyla, subclasses, 
So that's one good thing about his system. It is flexible and you can work with it that way. So make sure you can write down in order from largest, that means the biggest has the most organisms in it, kingdom, all the way down to the most well-defined species, which has one type of organism, like all the dogs in one species, all humans in one species, all cats in one species. Now, look at the uh, kingdom. In science, you've heard of that kingdom, and it not in a science sense. And it's, it's used as a territory that was ruled by a king or a queen. But in science, it is a classification category. And it is what used to rank at the very top. Now, we have actually added above that into what we call domains. So technically, it goes domains kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Now I want you to understand that how these levels work. The more classification levels that two organisms share, the more characteristics they have in common. Because if you look at the domain, there's a wide variety of organisms in here. And you can see all kinds. Then when you get down to kingdom, do you notice which some of them are left off? And what's left off in kingdom animalia are the protozoans, the fungi, any plants, but all the insects, reptiles, fish, birds, and so forth are in kingdom animalia. Then you go to phylum chordata, and what is left off? Dragonflies and insects. That means that these organisms have more in common than a dragonfly has with a lion, or a fish, or a reptile, or a bird. Then when you get down to class AVs, aviation, flying, that's all birds. So now you've left out the reptile, fish, and so forth. And you got all birds in AVs. But there's all kinds of birds. So we have to subcategorize that. And then as you go down, notice now it's not all birds when you get down to the order, it's just types of owls. And obviously this fourth owl doesn't have as much in common with the other three because when you go down to family, that owl doesn't belong in the family. And then this black owl on the right doesn't have as much in common as these two owls. And then to get to that one specific owl that you're talking about, you go down to the species. So the more classification levels that two organisms share, the more characteristics they have in common. So these two that are in the same genus have a lot more similarities, commonalities, than all the other organisms up there in the same domain. As you move down the levels, there are fewer kinds of organisms. You're excluding groups of organisms each time you go down a level. Organisms are placed into domains now, and that has been actually up above kingdoms, and we have three domains that we're going to talk about. So organisms are placed into domains and kingdoms based upon their cell type, their ability to make food, and the number of cells in their body, and we talked about that already. So here we have the three, well actually they only have two of them here. Okay, uh, levels of classification. They got two domains showing down here. And then they have eukaryotic, which is another one, the eukaryotes. Some classification systems have an eighth level, and we really go by that. Our book goes by that now. And it's a level that is broader. It's bigger. It has more organisms in it than a kingdom does because it's above the kingdom. Organisms are now classified into one of three domains and then into the, one of the six kingdoms. And they kind of shorten the names here. I don't want you to learn these domain names because that's just, um, actually, that's the kingdom. So I want you to learn the right ones. Okay, the domain U bacteria. U bacteria, that word U comes from eugenics. And uh, it means good. And that means good bacteria. Now, it doesn't mean every single one of them are good for you. 
A lot of them are. We usually think of bacteria, you think about, you know, that cause disease and all that. And the ones that I have listed up there are. They're the bad ones that cause disease, you know, like salmonella. We've heard about that with the um, cantaloupes now. E. coli, remember we had a breakout of that in, at Whitewater one year. And th those are pretty nasty, and they cause bad, but they're true bacteria. And there's lots of good ones, ones that we that actually decompose. Can you imagine if we didn't have any decomposers on the earth? And there's nitrogen-fixing bacteria that actually is able to take nitrogen, to convert nitrogen gas into ammonia, and that can help us. And it also will put nitrogen into the soil for the plants. And it also is used to make cheeses and uh, to make some other things uh, like uh, yogurt. Now the archaebacteria are the strange ones. There's not as many bacteria here, very few. And they didn't find these, and I have a slide on it later on, until, you know, not too long ago. Because these are the bacteria that live in areas that are the most extreme environments that we have on Earth. They live in places like hot springs. If you ever saw the hot springs at Yellowstone National Park. They live in very salty water. They live in swamps. They live in the volcano vents in the Pacific Ocean floor. And they live in the intestines of cows. Now the eukaryotes, or eukarya is the domain, that's where most of the living organisms that you know about are going to be. And we have th uh, four kingdoms there. Protista, plantae, animalia, and fungi. So be able to list the six types or the six kingdoms that we have. There's Archie bacteria, and they're the strange ones. Very few live in very harsh environment conditions. There's eubacteria, the true bacteria. There's protists in kingdom proto, uh, protista. There's fungi in kingdom fungi. And there's plants in kingdom plantae and animals in kingdom animalia. Now let's look at each one of these. Now you don't need to write any of this kind of stuff down. It's just to give you some information about them. It wasn't until 1983 that they actually found the first Archibacteria. And uh, they discovered, I think the first ones was at Yellowstone National Park in the hot springs there. And so uh, they live in such harsh conditions that most everything is killed in those, they can't live in those kinds of harsh conditions. And so they're uh, pretty unique looking, and a lot of times many are very bright colored. Eubacteria is, as I said, the true bacteria. They're the kinds that are found everyone, the most familiar, the ones that also do causes uh, diseases but some produce vitamins, and we're going to learn about some of those even in our own colon that does. And there's a, some that cause, like strep throat's been going around, and uh, bronchitis, those are caused by bacteria. Kingdom Protista has a very, a lot of odd, it's like all the leftovers that didn't fit in the other kingdoms are put in Kingdom Protista because it has all the algae except blue-green algae. Blue-green algae is in eubacteria, and the reason is because of its cell structure. But it has green bacteria, which is the volvox that I have pictured up there, all the circles. It has diatoms, those are those little spiky-looking things. It has the euglena, which is that long organism, and it's a unicellular organism. So uh, there's a lot of organisms that belong in Kingdom Protista, they're kind of ones that are the odds and ends. Kingdom fungi are fungus, and a lot of people don't realize that mushrooms are fungus, mold is fungus, and mildew is fungus. And uh, when you get ringworm on you, that's actually a fungus living on your skin. And when you eat mushrooms, that's a fungus. And there's mold, and some mold is quite deadly. Uh, so that's different kinds of fungi. Those are the puff balls that you've probably stepped on. Kingdom plantae, of course, are all the plants, some flowering, some not, ferns. 
It's also the trees. They are the autotrophs. They are the ones that have the ability to make their own food. There's only two kingdoms that have multicellular organisms, and that's plants, kingdom plantae, and kingdom animalia. So all the other kingdoms are unicellular or colonial. And a lot of them are just unicellular. Lots of species, as you can see. And king kingdom animalia, well, usually you think of horse, cows, cats, dogs, but it does include crustaceans, it includes reptiles, it includes bony fish, non-bony fish. Um, it includes birds, it includes insects, it includes worms. So all of those are animals as well. And they're the heterotrophs. They're the ones that have to get their food from somewhere else because they do not have the ability to make it. Now, why do we need a system to classify? Just in Kingdom Animalia alone, there's over one million known species. And I've read in some areas where taking all the kingdoms into account, there's over five million known organisms. So that's a lot. We have to have some way to classify them, to deal with them, and to uh, work with them. So what about us? Unfortunately, they do put man in this classification system. We are classified under Kingdom Animalia, class, Phylum Chordata, Class Mammalia, Order Primates, and then you get down to our, our scientific name, which is Homo sapiens. Uh, we really do not belong. We are unique from every other living creature. We were made in God's image. God breathed into us and we became a living soul. No other organism did God breathe into. He just spoke them into existence and they became. But he actually breathed into Adam's nostrils and that's when he became a living soul. So we are not animals. We did not come from animals, yet they do classify it. So as long as you understand that we are unique, we are special, we are created in God's image. We are the highest of God's creation. Now you may wonder, well, why do we put them in? Well, mainly to work with their system because some Christians are actually coming up with a classification system. So why don't Christians invent a Christian classification system that would not be influenced by evolutionary bias? Any new system that uses physical characteristics, which unless we're going to use DNA, is going to use physical characteristics as their basis for classification, would likely group almost all the organisms quite similarly. Of course, we would not have humans in with the animals. The ones that are working on such a system, they call it bara or bara menology. It comes from the Hebrew word bara, which means create. In the beginning, God created. That's bara. He created. And men means kind. Everything reproduces after its own kind. So bara menology attempts to classify orders or organisms according to what we call their biblical kind. Now let's look at what the difference is uh, between that. Now this system, a lot of Christians don't agree with making up a new system because it's going to be very similar, which is going to create more confusion. It's just that we realize we're made specially. We are not animals, even though man puts us in kingdom animalia. <clears throat> 